Blacksmith Her Radio, forging blacksmiths together. Hola, honchos. Welcome to Blacksmith Her Radio. It's Victoria, and it's episode number 56, and I've got Jake James on the line today. Jake James is a British-born blacksmith, and he operates his business out of his forge in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, Canada. He has training from the Hereford College of Arts in England and also apprenticed under Richard Bent for three years. He's also one of the demonstrators for this year's Abana Conference in Salt Lake City. That's going to be an incredible demonstration. He, he's handpicked 12 talented blacksmiths from across the country to help him uh, in making a collaborative sculpture. And the sculpture, he just released a picture of it on Facebook. And it's Hephaestus, and it's going to be beautiful. Thank you, Jake, for your time. It was incredible. And I also want to thank today's sponsor, and that's Abana, the Artist Blacksmith Association of North America. Uh, this nonprofit organization began in 1973 to perpetuate the noble art of blacksmithing. And all right, let's uh, dive right into this interview with Jake. Hi, Jake. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing very well, thank you. Oh, good. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, let's talk about your background in in blacksmithing, mainly your educational background. I did the bulk of my training in England. Uh, stumbled into blacksmithing completely by chance, um, and was then very quickly directed to go to the Hereford College. Hereford Center of the Arts, as it is now, where they run a pretty extensive range of blacksmithing classes from a one-year to a two-year, and now they run through to degrees, and it's it's a pretty major program. I ended up taking just one year of the schooling, um, which went you know really well. Sort of became very clear very early on that blacksmithing and me were supposed to be together, <laughs> you know, match made in heaven sort of thing, and. Uh, through the college, we took a, a, a work placement um, over the, the Easter holiday time. The fellow I went to work with, Richard Bent, who is, he's been in, toured and demonstrated in the States. Um, he took me on uh, straight, straight after school. So I went from the one year at Hereford. I ended up spending three years with Richard. Wow. Working as pretty much his sole employee. Um, and I don't think I could have been anywhere better in terms of my personal growth as a smith. I mean, our styles have since diverged and become, you know, we have very, very obviously distinct styles, but he taught me a great deal about how to think about steel and how to, how to free up my, my, my design. Um, a great technical smith. Mm. So, and his, his, his philosophy was, well, the, the better I am, the quicker I will do his work and the better I am as an employee. So he just pushed me really hard, invested a great deal of time and effort into my training, uh, for which I remain eternally thankful. But uh, his, his great saying is that uh, we're jazz blacksmiths. There's no mistakes, only opportunities. Um, and that, regardless of how our, how our approach to the actual piece of steel has changed in terms of design, that philosophy, that's one of those statements that stuck with me. You know? Nice. A lot of my most interesting sculptural pieces came from trying to do one thing and then seeing a form develop right. while I was doing something completely different and running with that and that takes you down an entire, you know, you're at the crossroads and you think you're going to go one way and you end up going down the other way. It's far right. more interesting. So, so tell me this. Um, what do you think of, I, I don't know, what was more valuable, being at Hereford for a year or then being with Richard for three years? Um, in terms of actual development, being with Richard for three years was, I couldn't, I, you know, there are Smiths who I could have done, experienced different things with, but in terms of my personal growth, no, that, the three years with him was fantastic. And I think that would be true of most Smiths you could work with, but I wouldn't have been any use to him or, or his, his, his investment into me would have been deeply offset had I not had that first year at Hereford because I came out of the school, I could fire weld, I could weld. I mean, right. I wasn't a welder, 
but I had a grounding in all the basic techniques, metal fabrication, bench fitting, welding, right. and forging and design. I, you know, I could, I could do all the basic techniques to a level where he could then take me and easily mold me into a working smith. I didn't have the hours at the anvil that you need mm-hmm. to be a good smith, but I had an understanding of the technique. So I think that, I think that's what I think has been really hard for smiths in the States is that there isn't that school where you can go and take a right. solid year of basic training. You know, there's the fantastic program at Carbondale that, that once you have some skills down, is an, um, the, the students coming out of there all produce, well, not all, but the vast majority are producing beautiful work and have incredible skills. But to get to the point where you can go to that school is the tough bit. There's lots and lots of short courses but there's nothing that is just okay. You're going to spend a year being a blacksmith at your own cost, not someone else's cost. Right. Yeah. So I, I would say the two things were both deeply important. But the year at Hereford is the stepping stone that I think is is lacking for North American smiths trying to get into it. Why like did you might... only spend one year? Um, because I was offered the job with Richard, and I I talked to the I talked to the staff at the college and I thought about it and they, they, Richard had taught at the college as a guest lecturer and was, he was, he's, he's well enough known in England um, as, as, a, you know, as, a, as a, an innovative, very innovative Smith. And um, the general opinion was you will learn more with Richard than you will at the college. And you'll learn it in a professional setting too, where, you know, you have all the pressure of make this right. Cause otherwise we're losing money. Which, mm-hmm. you know, the pressure is great. It, yeah. it makes you up the plate. It's kind of a sink or swim situation. So. Finn, how long have you been in Vancouver or in Canada? I've had my business open now for 10 years. I've probably been, well, 2002 is when I left England. I think I got to Canada in 2003. Oh, so. okay. All right. And then you immediately opened your own forge business. Uh, as soon as I had my residency. So... So I've had the I've had the business open for the last ten years. Yeah. And what was your so business I, model at that time? Was it uh, the gates and architectural, or was it art and gallery, public art? You make it sound so professional. My business model was that I desperately wanted to be a blacksmith, so, <laughs> so, so I opened the shop. I'm still trying. I'm still trying to figure out what my business model is, Victoria. Um, <laughs> I think that I think that's the greatest curse of. of of being a blacksmith, isn't it? So we're supposed to be business people. Um, I, ha- I haven't figured it out. I, I I do whatever comes into the shop. Yeah. I love, I love making sculpture, but I also have a family of three kids and a wife who I am not prepared to put on starvation rations to satisfy my egotistical craving to make sculpture. Quite yet, anyway. They're still growing. Once mm-hmm. they finish growing, they can go on starvation rations. Right. Um, <laughs> So, um, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to say that I had a plan, um, but I didn't. I just had fantastical levels of self-belief that I was going to be successful as a blacksmith and blindly pursued my passion. Um, and it's largely worked out. I've had some good commissions. I'm probably now actually, what are we, 10 years in, I'm actually now starting to think about needing a business model and being more sensible and growing up about it. Um, you know, I'm developing a product line to have actual cash flow into the business rather than bouncing between commissions and really trying to focus. You know, having built an interesting body of work based on stuff just coming in, I'm now trying to refine what I do. And I would like to be doing gates. Gates? Prim- primarily gate, And I'll pick up any architectural work that comes in. I would like to do gates and entryways. So, well, tell us about your shop then. Is it so it's accessible to the public? I do have a showroom in the shop. I don't promote it as being open to the public. So I use it more as a meeting space for clients. Mm-hmm. Um, if I do an open studio, it's a great clean space. I have my drawing and office up there. So it's it's nice to have. But but my shop is out outside of Victoria, which is not a big town. You know, 300,000 people in Victoria. It's a, it's a small shop. Um, I've extended it a little bit, a couple of... Heath Robinson sort of lean-tos on the back of it. 
Um, but I have a concrete floored area that is fabrication area, you know, welder and bandsaw and drill press. And, and then I have a, a dirt floored lean to, which is my forging area. I got one power hammer. I'm about to install a second power hammer and a press, fly press. What have I got? Three gas furnaces, coke fire, a couple of big anvils, and um, as much tooling as I can build. You know. mm -hmm. But I'm really excited to be installing a second power hammer. That's going to be fun. Nice. Different size? So I have a, yeah, I have a, an 88 kilo D more, which is a Belgian power hammer. That is an absolute sweetheart machine. I mean, <laughs> it's, it hits insanely hard, but is fantastically controllable and generally is a lovely machine, but I just bought a Massey 300 weight clear space, which is a, sort of the Rolls Royce of, of power hammers as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Um, I just picked one of those up in Vancouver. It's an old machine, but it still runs good. So a little bit bigger and it has, it has a hugely long stroke. I think it's got close to 20 inches of stroke under the, between the dies. So you wow. can stack up, stack up tooling and just loads of room to work. Out of your shop, you also teach lessons. Yeah. Um, I have been teaching these little one and two day beginner level workshops, and I'm actually going to stop doing those mainly because I, I find the process of lining up four or five people to take a class on the same day is tedious beyond all compare, and I don't, I'm not close enough to a big center to, to have a, a really good lineup and I'm far enough away from the States that not that many people are going to want to come up here for one day. So I'm going to stop doing the one and two day classes. And I'm going to focus on uh, doing corporate event weekends. Really? That's my, that's my plan. Yeah. What do you mean? Team, like a, like a, like a team building weekend. So uh, a, a corporation will hire me for between three days and a week, depending on what level of class I'm, they, or what level of product they want to receive. And then I will take in six, six people from the office and have them either completely build a sculpture in a weekend, a little small piece that they can take away and put on their reception desk or whatever, or they'll hire me for a week and I will prep a sculpture have them come in, make all the interesting bits, and then finish it and deliver it again. So they could either buy a small piece or a big piece. But your passion really lies in in um, coming up with sculptural, artistic designs. Is that correct? Yes, I think that's fair to say. Um, and would you want to teach classes doing that? And I, I've done a few of those recently, um, mostly down in the states. Um, oh, one of them was recent. You're right. It was on the East Coast, center of the center uh, of metal uh, arts or something. Prince, um School, the center for metal arts, just outside of New York. It was, it was great. I'll give him props. He's great school. You could go and take a class with Patrick Quinn. But um, All right. the, the week we did was, I think we had sixteen Smiths. Wow. Seven days, and uh, I turned up with a blank piece of paper and. Uh, and we designed the sculpture. I I'd, I'd kind of figured out what I wanted to do with them. So we we came in, designed the sculpture on the first day, and then built it in the remaining six days. How and did you guys great. go about designing it in the first day with one piece of paper? <laughs> I, I had, I mean, I have a, I guess I'm starting to develop a recognizable style. So that, sure. that, 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 um, give you an easy point to start with. You know, they they all all the people that came were sort of familiar with the shapes I like to forge, um, so that immediately gives you kind of a, a vocabulary to use with which you can construct the the, the design. Um, I I had the concept of this this sort of revision of a, one of the Greek myths. We did the we did the discovery of wine, um, and then yeah, we just said okay, what these are the characters I like to I like to use. These are the this is the 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 feel of the sculpture I'd like to generate. And I mean, I ended up doing most of the drawing, mm -hmm. but we all sat around and you know I was having to throw throw ideas at me. And I, what I initially sent out with me and I was I want to do 
this wine room sculpture, discovery of wine. I had my idea about doing this thing of, you know, an, an inebriated Bacchus being, you know, force-fed wine by, by Pan. That was in, in my head. Um, but I wanted them to, to think, well, what do you what do you relate to with wine? You know, you mention wine to a blacksmith, and immediately everyone goes and knocks out a leaf and a bunch of grapes and some twirly whirlies. And I was like, okay, I want you to think about what you want to do with wine, and I'm not going to let you forge a grape or a vine. Leaf. And it's like it's like turning to scrolls to me. It's like you know we have come a long way in blacksmithing, but we still fall back into these old cycles. Like there's so much you can do about wine. I mean, it's Wine's been there since the beginning of civilization. It's almost as old as blacksmithing. What do you think the students walked away with from that experience? It was a six-day course? Seven days. This is, hopefully. <laughs> um, I, I, hopefully a little bit more freedom when it comes to approaching a piece of steel. Um, yeah. the, way, the way I describe, describe my my thought about steel now is when, when I when I first started blacksmithing, the teacher said to us, okay, when you think something, it's often very easy to think something and very difficult to make it. So what you should do is you should take a piece of plasticine and see if you can make it in plasticine, which is entirely true because plasticine responds just like hot steel. It splits and tears and has all the same responses. But my, my thought process over the years has been, okay, if I hand a six-year-old child or a four-year-old child a piece of plasticine and say, make me something cool, what are they going to do with it? And I'm fairly certain what they're not going to do is roll it out into a nice even taper and then bend it into a curly whirly spiral. That's not how plasticine is meant to be played with. Mm -hmm. When a, uh, a small child gets a piece of plasticine, they're going to ball it up in their fists and go squish, 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 ooh, and squeeze this cool shape out of it. And you're like, wow, that's awesome. That's so <laughs> mind blowingly free. And I would never think of that. And that's how I approach steel. Iron is a soft material when it's hot. The finished material should express the softness that we experience while we work it. Mm. If you take a piece of steel, you make it soft, and you work it so that it looks like it's hard again. Yeah. And back in the old days, sure, you got a bloom of iron came into your shop and you forged it into a square bar. That is fantastic skill. I get a square bar delivered to my shop. I don't want to reforge it into a square bar. That's silly. <laughs> it's a waste of time and effort. You know, there are cheaper and more efficient ways that I can make things square than forging it with a hammer. But when I take my hammer to a piece of steel, I can turn it into this weird, wonderful, squished out shape. Well, I can't do that with anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a friend of mine said it to me once in, in a comment, and it's definitely become something that I really, really use as kind of a design premise is that uh, texture should come as the result of generating form. Like all those fuller marks that I chop into the bar and yeah. those circles. I don't chop the fuller marks in because I think the fuller marks are pretty. I chop the fuller marks in because that's how I'm curving the bar. Got or it. When, I'm using, when I'm using fullers and things under the power hammer, I'm leaving all the imprints of the fullers and the tooling in the material because I really enjoy the texture, but I'm using that tool to... Like I use I use fullers and, and all the shaping tools. I use them like a palette knife. Like traditionally, we use a fuller to separate block A from block B so that we can forge in, in between or draw a thing away. I think I think I use all those top tools under the power hammer like a pallet knife. Mm -hmm. I use them to spread and to push and to squeeze the material. And I think that's... If you think of it like that, then you're immediately not thinking. If you think this tool is a pallet knife, when you look at your piece of steel, you're not thinking this is a piece of steel. Because if you think this is a piece of steel, now I must make it look like a piece of steel. Right. I must forge it square and... And, and I must pull this taper evenly and, and, and your brain falls into a pattern. Whereas if you say this tool is a palette knife, now you're not looking at that piece of steel as a lump of steel. You're thinking, okay, well, how can I spread it? How can I, how can I push it? How can I build that texture in there? I think there's, a, I think there's another resurgence going on right now with a generation of smiths my age and younger who are really kicking out some killer work and, you know, there's a new generation of gallery owners coming in who maybe are going to be more open to right. to taking yeah. up a material that has not traditionally been represented in the art world. Who are those young smiths that are coming out and doing non-traditional, incredible, artistic uh, who, work? Who's right now, um, well, the, 
pretty much the entire team that I'm leading a banner, Salt Lake City. Um, I got I picked twelve of twelve. I'm not, they're not all super young, but they're all hot young Smiths doing really interesting work. Um, uh, who have we got there? You know, Patrick Quinn, um, Andy Dona. Um, he's he's a very senior journeyman to set up a shop on the East Coast. Um, Brett Moten, he's again more of a senior guy, but he's doing interesting work down in California. You've got a bunch of young guys out of Carbondale, Hailing Dwang and Dan Widow, Tim Dale, and Clicker, and Kenzie Martin, who works with Dylan Sculpture. And they, they, these are all, I mean, sounds silly for me to say, but these are all, a lot of them are younger than me, they've got tons of energy. And it's an interesting time, I think, in smithing. The old guard are all retiring. The guys who we all think of as the Smiths, right, in England and and in the States and through Europe, they're all retiring, you know. Guys guys I grew up, I grew up with, guys who I idolized as Smiths when I started uh, 16 years ago, they're all retiring now. And it's going to create, I think, a, a really good vacuum in the, you know, just by nature of how a business grows, those guys were all sucking up all the really good jobs mm -hmm. they were the biggest. Yeah. Now they're all retiring, and you know I've heard a lot of the old guys saying, "Oh well, terrible time to be a smith now." Oh well, you know, well, all the modern technologies. There's no, you know, the, the market's changing and all this stuff. And I'm like, you know, I think you guys are just getting old <laughs> when you're retired. <laughs> that's that's all it is. Because I, I look around and there's this this whole generation of smiths coming up that. It, Kick-ass, good. You know they've they've benefited. They've got they haven't had to reinvent the craft. The, right. the, the original generation of a banner and barber, they did the hard work of reviving blacksmithing mm -hmm. and developing new skills. And then you know we coming along and we're like, hey, wow, I love what they did with that tool, but I think I could also do this with it. Right. And that that sh that brain shift of approaching the craft has has I think happened. So now you've got whole bunch of people coming up that have got this real freedom with material and, and, a, and a, a standard that has been set extremely high. Mm -hmm. If you want to push good work out there now, you've got to push really good work out because the bar's been set by Tom Joyce and the Bondies and, and Albert Paley and people. Like you can't just walk out there with your, with your thing that you made for a craft bear and say, I'm a great smith nowadays because we're going to look through all of our books and be like, oh. Not as good as Claudio, are you? <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, well, the, st the bar is really high. So if mm -hmm. you're going to come up and you want to be a real, you know, you want to push your smithing, you got to push hard. Mm -hmm. But it's easier to push because the ground has already been plowed. You know, we just got to come along and keep it tilled. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. In terms of that kind of conceptual thinking about iron. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Good. I like it. So um, what is the Savannah team all about? Um, it's kind of a follow-on from from a few things I've done uh, over the over the last few years. I've been asked to demonstrate at, a, at various places. I've, I went to Australia and I went to England and, and done in California and then recently one in in, uh, in uh, New York there. And I'm really not interested in standing in front of a crowd and making a thing because I think you learn something by watching someone else work, but you learn an awful lot more by doing it. Mm -hmm. So. I, I've, I've engineered my demonstrations to be collaborative efforts where you're not coming to watch me work, you're coming to listen to me tell you how to work. Wow. Um, and we're going to do the same at a banner. So we're going to, I've got, I'm going to have 12 Smiths working nonstop for the three days, which having committed to do it now, I'm like, wow, that's, that's really, that's, that's a lot. Be a, be a circuit. <laughs> But they're all great smiths. Like the, the team that I've picked are all, they're all well on the path to being independent smiths. And all of them within a year or two could probably, should be, some of them already have demonstrated for a banner as individuals. I mean, this is, this is a team of ringers. Um, so Why 12? Because it's going to be a hell of a show. And we can get a lot of work done. 12, yeah. 12 is a number I can manage. I can manage 12 smiths, especially if I know I've got, you know, in, it's going to be four teams of three. I'm going to put one of the more senior Smiths with each of the teams. And, you know, I want to be able to be like, right, you make this. You know how I think. You've worked with me before. This is what we're going to do. And I just, I think it'll be really exciting. We're going to put together a, a, a larger than life-size sculpture. We're going to take on doing her face this. Really? 
Ooh. And I've got a few days to do it, and so I wow. need a lot of smiths to do it. Um, we're probably pulling people off the bleachers to swing sledgehammers when people start dropping off, you know, with exhaustion. Um, <laughs> There'll be plenty of volunteers, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, how, how large do you want it to be? Probably be seven or eight feet tall. Wow. The tallest. I really enjoy asking this of most of my guests. And um, this one is, if you could spend one day learning from any blacksmith, dead or alive, who would that be? I thought about this, and uh, probably Professor Tony Benetton. Oh. Yeah. Um, because he, 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 for me, was the guy that sort of kick-started that kind of plastica style of work, really, really took blacksmithing in a direction that, for me, is the most exciting direction it's been in for ages. Mm-hmm. And, that was amazing. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, do you have anything else to add, Jake? Go and play with plasticine. Don't 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 think about don't think about tapers and straight lines. Or don't think about Fibonacci spirals. They're beautiful. If you really want to look at a beautiful Fibonacci spiral, look at a comp shell, and you're never going to make anything that beautiful. So mm. yeah. leave natural spirals up to nature, and we'll do what we do best, which is you know humanize things. If you work it with your hands rather than the tools that you think you're going to use, because you can do things with your hands that you can do, because I've discovered this, you can do them with tools, it's very difficult, but you can. Like When you squeeze something in your hands, you're squeezing from both directions and you're probably rolling it off center as you do it. Well, you can do that with sledgehammers and tooling and anvils and roll, mm. you know. So by, by squeezing modeling clay in your hands, you're working it in a way that is, again, it's like like that palette knife idea. You're not constraining yourself immediately by thinking, I've got to hit it on the anvil with my hammer, make it go this shape. So, you know, squish it with your hands and then figure out how you do it afterwards. Hmm. Make the shape, make the shape and make it really complicated and then look at it and you'll find a way to do it. Maybe it may be painful and you may mess it up a whole bunch of times. Never happens to me, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, that's that's how you learn, right? You learn how far can I how far can I turn this piece of material off center while I'm stretching it and hitting it at the same time before it tears. Right. And the second one, you know it's gonna tear, so you hit it one last hit. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Jake. I really appreciate today. That was an excellent conversation. Thank you for inviting me uh, on. Thank you for listening to Blacksmither Radio, the only show that features blacksmiths around the world. Visit our website at blacksmither.com slash podcast to view the show notes for this episode. Keep forging on, smithies.